Recording in progress. Well, uh, hello to everyone from everywhere <laughs> in the world. Um, we're so, certainly glad that you're here today. And uh, we'll be continuing, Jacob's going to be continuing in uh, uh, Romans 1. And so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you and fellowship together and learn from you and from your word. We pray that you would be with Jacob today and give him uh, your words to say uh, from your written word. We thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word in freedom. And we just pray that you would bring peace to this world. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you so much for joining us. We're continuing our midweek Bible study, and we're doing so despite the opposition and censorship we're getting from the powers that be in Silicon Valley, who are largely godless, anti-Christian, anti-family, anti-life, anti-anything that's godly. But they have the power for the time being, they think. Uh, we know from the book of Daniel that their time is short, and unless they repent and begin serving the rightful king of the universe, they're going to spend it in eternal regret. Um, again, we know from Daniel that God works through human sources, even unsaved people. We see that Paul was shown benevolence by Roman government officials and by ship captains of, of the Roman government, people who are completely non-Christian. We see in Daniel and so forth, and in and, and, and the book of Esther, that God used even unsaved people for his purposes in helping and assisting his people. And that's happening today. Um, we need to pray about the situation of censorship. It's encroaching. It's getting worse. I personally would love to see Elon Musk get saved. He's not anti-God or anti-Jesus, but he's certainly not a believer. And I would love, he has the muscle and the money to take on Silicon Valley. Not many people do. I hope the Lord gives him grace because those people are just downright wicked, uh, totally wicked. Um, it doesn't matter. It's, it's just terrible. And uh, also Mr. Trump is beginning his own social media I hope the Lord prospers him as well as an alternative to what's happening. We know that the subject that we're going to propound tonight um, on Romans chapter 1, where it begins to deal with homosexuality and God's abhorrent view of it as unnatural and perverse uh, and even debaucherous, that that's going to be considered hate speech by these people, and they'll use that as a premise to close us down and censor us. So we've begun making alternative arrangements. We've gone on to other platforms such as Odyssey and, and Rumble, of course, and various ones. But uh, also we are on RTN and we are going to begin using our own server very soon. And YouTube will just be a, uh, a feeder, a, a place to redirect people to our own server. We need to place ourselves outside of their control. They've been giving us absolute hell, to be perfectly honest. They've given us, this is the second time they've closed us down. They've given us now three strikes. They uh, called me and called us conspiracy theorists. They uh, declined our uh, appeal. And when we began censoring ourselves, in other words, they want to control what you can and cannot say. So even when we tried to placate them and censor ourselves, they went back with their algorithms or whatever we think and got things from the past to come after us for. There's just no negotiating with these people. They're evil and they have an agenda. I've been praying against them for some time, and I would just like to think providentially that the things happening in the news today with uh, – with Twitter is the beginning of God's judgment on them. Uh, we're not here to politically editorialize tonight, but I've always said that 
internet belongs to the public, even though Barack Obama took it away from the American people and gave it to the United Nothing. Uh, it does not belong to any government or to any company. Uh, it should therefore be regulated as a public utility with protection of First Amendment, with free speech rights. Uh, that is my personal view. Others may have other views. That's okay as well. But I do know that social media, and even what we're doing now, can be a powerful instrument for propounding the gospel, for expounding the word of God. And it's also, the devil knows that, and he's attacking through it, being sure that these things can only be used for evil. They will allow radical homosexuality, homosexual indoctrination of children. They will allow um, radical Islam. They will allow every kind of pornography, sexual perversion imaginable. They will do all that, but they will go after Christians who are upholding biblical morality. The world was in the power of the wicked one. And of course, most of the politicians are in bed with them. But again, their time is coming. Their time is short. We have to make use of the time we have before the Lord comes. I would point you to the new book, No Bomb in Gilead. No Bomb in Gilead. What really happens after the rapture? What really takes place after the faithful church has been removed by rapture and resurrection? Now, again, I'm not trying to make a sales pitch per se. I assure you, all royalties, my royalties are donated. I accept no nothing. Either I get no royalties, or if I do, it's donated back to the ministry, depending on the laws of which country. But uh, I'm not trying to make a profit. I'm just trying to equip the church for the time in which we live. Uh, no bomb in Gilead. What really happens after the rapture? And uh, it tries to clarify not only what the scripture says, but it tries to debunk a lot of things that people believe that scripture does not say, such as there's going to be some great end time revival triggered by the rapture. So No Bomb in Gilead is the book. And now we're continuing with Romans chapter 1. Turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 1. I just went through this in Greek a short time ago. Uh, but let's continue where we left off last week. Let's begin uh, in verse 11. For I long to see you in order that I might impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you, while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. Okay, let's begin with this idea of impartation in verse 11. Impartation in verse 11. Turn with me, please, to 2 Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, discipline, etc. Okay. Now, that word gift is charism. Charism. We always have to understand there are different words for gifts, and people get them confused as to what they mean. Charism is where we get the word charismatic. These speak of the basically nine charismatic gifts in Corinthians. It speaks of tongues, interpretation of tongues, of prophecy. It speaks of the word of knowledge, speaks of the word wisdom, gifts of healing, gifts of miracles. These are the charismatic gifts. Now, that I might impart some gift to you, impart some gift. Notice he is non-specific about which one. You see people today trying to lay hands on someone and say, just move your lips like this and say whatever comes into your mind. I think that's tongues. It's gibberish. It's not tongues. Now, there is the gift of tongues, but that's not it. 
or you see people laying hands on someone and saying, I'm going to call you to be a prophet. And they lay hands on them and say, now you can prophesy. Uh, there's people who do this. There's people who believe this. Well, look with me, please, as some of you already know, to the book of Exodus chapter 30. Verse 30, you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may minister as priests to me. Notice the Lord designates who? This is by tribe, tribe of Levi. And you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, this shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. I know most of you know this, but for the sake of the recording, holy meaning set apart. It is set apart. To me, it shall not be poured on anyone's body, nor shall you make any like it in the same proportion. It is holy, and it's holy to you. Whoever shall mix any like it or puts any of it on a layman shall be cut off from his people. You cannot take someone's gift and put it on another person. It is holy, holy unto them. In Hebrew, it is mekudesh, mekudesh. Now, that term mekudesh comes from the word kodesh, holy in Hebrew, and it has two meanings in Scripture or two pri primary ways in which it is used. One, it is the high priest, the Aaronic high priest, who is mekudesh. He is set apart to go into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. He is consecrated to God. If anyone else went in, it would be an abomination. They would be struck dead or something. Whenever you see anyone other than the high priest on the Day of Atonement going into the Holy of Holies, they typify the Antichrist in some way. Separate but related subject. Okay. The other is matrimony. God sets this man apart to this woman God sets this woman apart to this man. Now, again, if someone other than the high priest tried to offer the appropriate ritual offering on the Day of Atonement, it would be an abomination. And if someone slept with someone's wife or someone's husband, it, adultery, it's, it's morally abominable. Well, this idea of transferring and anointing Transferring and anointing is abominable. It would be just as abominable. And people do it casually, even in some churches, if you want to call them churches. It's abominable. Uh, it's not transferable. Elijah and Elisha, again, you know the story. Elisha asked for Elijah's mantle of authority. And Elijah said, I can't give it to you. I'm like, go up in the chariot. If it falls down, God can give it to you, but it's not mine to give. Now, Elisha had, this, had the spirit of Elijah in double portion, but God had to give it. Elijah couldn't. Okay. In baptism of the spirit, you can have an impartation. And that impartation will normally include empowerment for ministry, not timidity. Remember, on Pentecost, they had timidity. Now it was empowerment. And there was a manifestation of charismata, of charismatic gifts, specifically then it was tongues. Now, it's not always tongues. But when someone is spirit baptized, you see they have a power. Somebody can teach a Bible study, and they can be doctrinally correct in what they say, but there's no anointing on it. There's no power of the Holy Spirit in it. There are churches that suppress the Holy Spirit, that are cessationist, and they may say true things. 
you also have, but it's not doesn't pack much punch. There's a spirit of timidity with a lot of these people. Then you have another phenomenon. You have people who are imagining themselves to be practicing spiritual gifts of a charismatic nature, tongues or prophecy or words of knowledge. It's just their imagination. As Jeremiah says, it's the futility and deception of their own mind. So you have people suppressing the Holy Spirit and depressing any charismatic manifestation. These are cessationists. Then you have those who counterfeit it, but not necessarily deliberately. They think it's real, but it's the futility and deception of their own mind. And in some cases, it could even be demonic. Okay. Then you've got a third category. Third category is an interesting one. I know many people from non-charismatic backgrounds, including brethren, Baptists, people who would in no sense identify themselves as being charismatic. Yet, they practice gifts of the Spirit, not knowing that's what it is. They practice gifts of the Spirit, not knowing that that's what they're doing because they've had wrong teaching. So let's just say on Maple Street in, uh, you know, Middle America in some church. There's two churches on Maple Street. There's a Baptist church, and then up the street there's a Pentecostal church. And in the Pentecostal church one morning there's a prophecy, and somebody gives a prophecy. I don't know. For some reason they like to do it in King James Elizabethan English. Yea, I say unto thee, amen, I say unto thee. Have I not called you to be my witnesses, saith the Lord? Have I not called you to go to the highways and byways and invite the perishing to come in? Have you not gone out, my children? Have you not gone out to reach the lost? For my heart is burdened for them. Thus saith the Lord. I'll forget that prophecy. Okay. And at the Baptist Street up the road, another guy stands up with his Bible and he says, Pastor, may I share something? I, I've been praying this week a lot about God's will and God's direction for our church. And as I prayed, I believe the Lord has impressed upon my heart to say that he wants us to be more concerned with witnessing and evangelism. We're not doing enough to reach the lost. We need to become more active in evangelistic outreach. I really believe that the Lord has impressed upon me to share this with the congregation. And he's a nice person, and he sits down with his Bible. Both of those things could be valid prophecies. The manner in which it is packaged and presented is irrelevant. The only question is, is that what the Lord is saying to the Christians in that community and two different churches? Now, remember, there may be different congregations in a location. But when we read the book of Revelation, in one location, there's only one church. It may meet in different places. There may be different assemblies, different congregations. Yes, but there's only one church. And if that's what the Lord is saying to that church at that location, out in the middle of America or anywhere, okay, if, if that's what the Lord is saying, well, that's the only thing that matters. The way it's packaged and presented. Now, this Baptist brother, this Baptist gentleman, who stood up and, and said that he, he, the Lord has led him to share something, because of his Baptist background and, and the teaching that, that groomed him, <laughs> He may not know that he was prophesying, but it's a prophecy. He just doesn't know that's what he's doing because of wrong teaching. Some other guy might be prophesying, but he thinks if you don't do it in King James English, 
it is, it is invalid. <laughs> Again, because the wrong teaching. Well, we have to get the right teaching on these issues. Spirit baptism, yes. Now we have tapes and teachings explaining baptism and spirit baptism, how it's one faith, one baptism, but our fathers were baptized under the water, which is water baptism, and the cloud, which is a spirit baptism. I don't want to digress into that today. The point is, Paul didn't say, I'm going to lay hands on you that you may prophesy, or I'm going to lay hands on you that you may speak in tongues, or I'm going to lay hands on you that you may do miracles, or I'm going to lay hands on you that you may do healings. He doesn't say that. He can't say that. It's not his place to give those gifts. It is holy. He also could not transfer his own apostleship. He could not transfer his own apostleship. You cannot transfer your ministry to another. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Only God could take the mantle of Elijah and give it to Elisha. It's not ours to give. It is holy. Now, unfortunately, many people take these particular passages, like the one we just read in Romans, and the accompanying passage in Timothy, and certain things from the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, and they arrive at some very peculiar doctrines. And when you get peculiar doctrines, you're going to get peculiar praxis. People are going to begin doing things that are not scriptural, not knowing it's not scriptural, or even, even not caring it's not scriptural, I'm sorry to say. Well, there is a place for laying on of hands. And John the Baptist said that Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The marks of spirit baptism are, first of all, holiness. In my own case, I struggled continually, even after becoming a believer, with my inclination to illegal drugs. When I was baptized in this water, I came out of the water and I was hit with the Holy Spirit. I had water baptism and spirit baptism simultaneously, like in Acts 2. For me, it was not two experiences, it was one. And that made a difference. That made an absolute difference. I didn't need the, the, the cocaine or pot or anything. It made a difference. The holiness was there. Uh, the second thing is power. Power. We cannot do the work of the Lord in our own strength. We must be empowered. We must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay. You can even see shy and timid people when they're baptized in the Spirit, and, and God uses them, they begin witnessing and things like this. These will normally be accompanied by charismata, by gifting. Now, that's another matter, the relationship between gifting and calling. Um, the charismatic gifts equip someone for their calling. Again, a separate subject. Please don't ask me about it at the question time. Listen to the recordings. Uh, if someone is called to be a pastor, for instance, that that's their calling. Well, frequently pastors will have the gift of the word of knowledge because the scriptures tell pastors know well the condition of your flocks. And a pastor, the Holy Spirit can show him so-and-so is having a problem in his personal life or in his marriage or something like this. Pastors may have the word of knowledge. There are people called to the mission field in the third world. There's a lot of disease. And good medical treatment is not available. You can have people who are missionaries in those situations who may manifest the gifts 
or gift of healing. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, you're up against witch doctors and things like this down there, but I'm not going there now. Uh, and we need to avoid the power of angels and stuff of the late John Wimber. It's not scripturally balanced. But, you know, um, an evangelist. Well, an evangelist, what charismatic gifts would help someone with evangelism? Uh, you know, what could it be? Well, it could be a word of knowledge. Um, it could be like Peter's charisma. It only happened to me one time in my life, one time only, and it was in Israel. And I was witnessing to a Jewish person, and I knew very little Hebrew at the time. And there was a language, and I had a word of knowledge about this person's background in a language that I couldn't speak. And I spoke it to them. And it caused them to freak out and get saved. It only happened to me one time where I actually spoke something to somebody in a language I didn't speak and they understood. Well, what charismatic gifts are going to equip you for the calling? Now, that's what Paul is talking about. So this tells us that the church in Rome was at an early stage where you had Gentile God-fearers, where you had Jews, and they came to believe Jesus was the Messiah, and they were born again. But they were not yet spirit-filled. Remember, when the <clears throat> apostles saw Jesus after he rose from the dead, <clears throat> he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. At that point, they had second birth. But then he told them, go wait for the Holy Spirit. The Spirit indwelled, the Spirit outpoured. Of course, on the day of Pentecost, the 3,000 got the package deal. And there's other combinations in the book of Acts as well. The family of uh, Cornelius, they were born again. They were baptized in the Spirit, and then they got baptized in water. You've got all different combinations. Again, I'd point you to our teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. The only thing you don't have is the baptism of somebody who's not saved that we don't have. But let's go back now to Romans. Uh, again, our subject tonight is not gifts of the Spirit. I was only dealing with it insofar as it relates to Romans chapter 1, or Romans chapter 1 relates to it. I couldn't just skip over it or whitewash it or avoid it. I had to deal with it pointedly, but not as a main focus. Okay. Then he goes on. That is, I may be encouraged together. And I do not want you, brethren, to be unaware that I often plan to come to you. And he was prevented in order that I might obtain some fruit even among the rest of the Gentiles. Now that's telling us he's writing primarily to a Gentile God-fearing community. Okay. I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians. Now notice this. Greeks and barbarians. Why does he make the distinction between Greeks and Barbarios in Greek, I read it tonight. Why that? The Greeks could read the Septuagint in their own language. They could read the Hebrew Scriptures. So there were God-fearing Greeks among them, but they were Greeks who had not converted to Judaism. There were monotheistic Greeks who had access or some access to hearing the Septuagint, who saw through the futility of idolatry and through the moral depravity of, 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 of the pagan society for what it was. These were just people who were Greek. Now, something else 
happens, and we have to be very, very careful here. But it is nonetheless true. Socrates was a monotheistic Greek. He said there was one true God for which he was forced to drink hemlock. In Romans 1, we see that because people are made in God's image and likeness, they can know certain things about him. And Socrates was one who did. His protege, Plato, wrote, man is like a chain of people chained to a wall in a dark, dingy cave. All they see is darkness. And one man manages to get free of the chains. And he begins to walk out, and he sees a pin of light. He didn't know what the light was, but he saw the light. And as he progressed towards the light, it got brighter and brighter, and he came outside. And he saw a brook with fish swimming in it, and he saw various species of birds flying and butterflies. He saw plants and flowers and shrubs and green grass, and he saw animals. And he was shocked that he saw the light. And the more he went to the light, the more he saw that there was a whole other world he knew nothing about. So he went back into the cave and he tried to tell the other people in the cave that he saw the light and they thought he was crazy. They ignored him. Now, doesn't that sound somewhat similar to our experiences as Christians? When we get saved and we go back and try to tell our unsaved friends and family what happens when we saw the light and they think that we become some kind of religious fanatic or we've lost our marbles or something like that. You know, John 1, the spirit blows where it wills. The, so is everyone born of the spirit of God. The world doesn't understand it and so forth. Well, certain monotheistic elements of Greco-Roman society, certain elements helped prepare the Greek and Greco-Roman world for the coming of the gospel, just as the Torah prepared the Jews. Now, this relates to the Hebrew and Greek way of thinking. Jews seek a sign, Gentiles seek wisdom. And Paul takes this into account in his writings. But Socratic monotheism from Socrates and the influence he had on certain other people, not Aristotle, but Plato, had an impact on opening people to the reality of the gospel. Now, when the law was there, the law of Moses could point Jews and, and converts to Judaism to Christ and to the gospel. When that happened, they were no longer under the law. <laughs> they were free from the law, which imputed sin. They were free from the law of Moses now they were under the law of Christ. As we're told in Hebrews, when you come to faith, the law has done its job. It's there as a teaching tool. We use it for purposes of biblical exposition to understand the New Testament, but it's fulfilled in Christ. It's done its job. So too, Socratic and Platonic philosophy did its job when the Gentile God-fearers 
came to believe the gospel. It did its job. It is job. The same as in Galatians, however, where you had legalistic Jewish Christians and others wanting to live under two covenants and go back under the law. You had the same thing in the Gentile church, people trying to retain Platonic philosophy as Christians and merge the two like the Galatians tried to merge Torah and the gospel. They tried to merge Platonic philosophy and the gospel instead of saying it's done its job. This happened with the church fathers, particularly the post-Nicene fathers and particularly Augustine and the people who influenced Augustine and the people who were influenced by him. They rewrote Christianity as a platonic religion. The church fathers rewrote Christianity as a platonic religion, going away from its Hebraic origin. Now, even today, you have groups like Seventh-day Adventists. They rewrote Christianity as a mosaic religion. They're into dietary laws. They're into Sabbatarian worship on the Saturday. They're back under the law. That's Seventh-day Adventism. They're huge in Southern California, Loma Linda, places like this. We've had people in our ministry who came from, from that background, very good Christians, but they had this mixture of truth and error, of living under two covenants, of, of, of Galatianism. Well, you had this mixture of Torah and the gospel among Seventh-day Adventists. And in the messianic movement today, there are hyper-messianic extremists who are doing the same thing. I don't mean that they're observant in Jewish practices. This week is Passover. Jewish Christians are going to celebrate the Passover and use it as a way to show how Christ is the Paschal Lamb. And they'll use it evangelistically and things like this, but not in a legalistic way, in a cultural and an evangelistic way and things like that. But you have a legalistic access of the Messianic movement. You have Seventh-day Adventists. And you've had people who've gone crazy with this stuff, like David Cordish, the dangerous stuff. Well, this mixture of the Torah and the gospel has a parallel in this mixture of Greek philosophy and the gospel that gained momentum under the church fathers. And tragically, tragically, in the Reformation, the Protestant reformers, instead of going back to the New Testament, went back to Augustine, who was a Platonist. Now, I would point you to our book, the Dilemma of Laodicea, we explain this in greater depth. Again, it's not our subject today. I'm only dealing with it relative to Romans chapter 1. So you had Greeks and Greeks. You had Greeks who were God-fearers, who, who could read the Hebraic scriptures in Greek, the Septuagint, who some of them, would, they would come to synagogues and meet Jews, and they were generally somewhat more cultured and educated, generally somewhat more cultured and educated at that time, somewhat. Um, I'm not saying there weren't ones who weren't, but some of them were, were people of certainly literacy. They were literate <clears throat> in, in, a, in a culture where a lot of people were not. Well, Paul's drawing a distinction between them and the barbarian ones, 
who were still s- steeped in idolatry and temple prostitution and all the superstition and immorality associated with it. So there were Greeks and there were Greeks, there were Greeks and there were barbarians, okay? He draws that distinction. We have to be careful not to always put people in the same basket. Broadly speaking, we can say there's the saved and the unsaved. But there are saved people who are somewhat knowledgeable of the Judeo-Christian scriptures, with whom you can have an intelligent conversation evangelistically. And there are others who are total barbarians who know nothing about it or a distorted view of it. I would have to put fundamentalist Muslims in that camp, but certainly in certain mission situations, certain tribal people. Yet, as we'll see, even they can know about the true God to a degree. Not to the degree of salvation, but to the degree of knowing there is such a God and that he has a moral standard. This is all in Romans chapter 1. Verse 15. Thus for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. That would tend to indicate, as we said last week, some of the people reading it were Gentile God-fearers. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also the Greek. We talked about this. How because the gospel is available to the Jew first because of covenant, the ramifications, the consequences of rejecting it are on the Jew first. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. We talked about this already, but the righteousness of God. The Torah, the law of Moses, teaches the righteousness of God. And by contrast to us, it is an indictment of the human race because of the unrighteousness of man. The Torah teaches about the righteousness of God, but it does so by teaching about the unrighteousness of man. The gospel also teaches about the righteousness of God, but it shows how we can be made righteous. Be holy as I am holy. Who can do that? Only one person has ever done that. That is Jesus. In Christ, we can be counted righteous. That's the gospel. Oh, the law, the Torah, it shows the righteousness of God by showing the unrighteousness of man. The gospel says, yeah, man is unrighteous, but let me show you how fallen man can be made righteous. Remember, there was only one religion God ever ordained, one religion, and that is Levitical Judaism. Religion, of course, is man trying to reach God. The gospel is the opposite of religion. It's God trying to reach man. But the Torah shows man could never reach God by his own works through the example of Israel and the Jews. Through the failure of Israel and the Jews, who are a microcosm of the human condition, the Torah shows we could never meet God's standards. We need a Messiah who did, who could. So, the Torah does that. Shows the righteousness. 
but it cannot give us the righteousness. <laughs> it can just show us our need for it. Now comes the gospel. If you don't understand law, you cannot understand grace. If we do not understand, all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. If we do not understand, none is righteous, no, not one. If we do not understand, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags, saith the Lord. If we do not understand that, we cannot understand the gospel. This relates to what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. In order to become a saved Christian, you have to recognize that you are spiritually impoverished because of sin, that we are impoverished, that we are poor in spirit, that we are bankrupt, that we are spiritually dead. We have no hope except a Savior, no other hope except a Savior, the poor in spirit. You must understand law before you can understand grace. One of the main deceivers I have seen in my lifetime, and I say this not to throw mud, I say it because it's a fact, and he had an unbelievable impact. And the church he left was another breakup from the movement he established just two weeks ago. I speak of the Vineyard Movement and John Wimber. I know some of you may remember this. John Wimber said, we are going to take the gospel out of the language of the courtroom and bring it into the family drawing room. And instead of God, as an angry, righteous judge, we're going to have him as a loving father. This Man spoke from the devil. And the Vinny movement was large, huge, and influenced many people. Its influences are still vestigially around today. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all put the gospel in the language of the courtroom. We were guilty. Jesus takes our guilt and is put on trial in our place and is condemned. It was the will of the Lord to save him. He served our sentence for all of us and for each of us. Unless we understand God's law has been broken, we cannot understand God's forgiveness in Christ. Unless we understand what the Torah means, we cannot understand what the gospel means. Now, of course, the Jews had 613 commandments, the ancient Hebrews. But everybody knows the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and every one of us has broken them. Every one of us has broken them. Every one of us is a liar. Every one of us is an idolater. Every one of us is an adulterer. Every one of us is a thief. Every one of us. Every one of us. Jacob Prash is a thief and a liar. You are a thief and a liar. The only one who wasn't the thief and a liar is Jesus Christ. He was God who became a man. The Paschal Lamb without blemish this week. One without sin is worth more to God than all the ones with sin. That is how he could be, again from the Vulgate, Agnus Dei Quitolus Pecata Mundi. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was put on the innocent one because we were guilty. If you don't understand law, you can't understand salvation. 
If you don't understand guilt, you can't understand the gospel. Uh, then, then, when there's a repentance and a regeneration and a coming to a saving faith in Christ, then you can look at the Father as a loving Father. But until that happens, he's an angry judge. And he's angry at every unsaved person. So, Paul writes this. It's the power. The righteousness of God is revealed. From faith, we could say faith in the Torah to faith in the coming of the Messiah. The righteous live by it, as we said last week. Now we begin verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We looked at this last week. No, we are not appointed unto wrath. But after the rapture of the church, the wrath of God will be poured out on the kingdom of Antichrist. And unsaved people, when they give up the ghost, will face the wrath of God. It is only those in Christ not appointed to wrath. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And as we looked at, those who do this, those who perpetuate ungodliness and unrighteousness, they will suppress the truth. People who try to justify godlessness, immorality, will always suppress truth. I remember a very long time ago when Hugh Hefner, the founder of the Playboy magazine and clubs and all that kind of stuff, his grandparents were Methodists. They may have been Christian. And his daughter was young at that time. And a reporter asked him about his playboy philosophy, which was just hedonism. It was hedonism. <laughs> uh, it only worked for affluent single men. <laughs> But that was his philosophy. And people emulated it. And he had all these bunnies and stuff like this. And the reporter asked him, would you want your daughter to be one of them? And you, Hefner, said the following. That is the one aspect of my playboy philosophy that I haven't worked out yet. <laughs> Wouldn't want it for his own daughter. Wouldn't want his own daughter being reduced to a sex object. But he built a multi, multi million dollar enterprise on reducing other people's daughters to sex objects. They will always suppress the truth in unrighteousness. But they know the truth. Romans 1 is trying to show us that even unsaved people know enough of the truth to know about their guilt, to know about the righteousness of God, They can know that. In verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them. God made it evident to them. Imagio Dei, made in his image and likeness. They're not saved. They're not believers. 
but they know they don't want somebody using their daughter as a sex object, or they know they don't want somebody sleeping with their wife or their husband. They know they don't want somebody ripping them off. They know they don't want somebody lying to them. Now, this is not to be confused with the natural theology of, of so-called medieval scholasticism and of Thomas Aquinas and things like that. We're sticking only to scripture. We're not going into the philosophy pretending to be theology. We're just going to look at scripture. But since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Cause and effect. Atheism is not only the paramount of human arrogance, it is the apex of human stupidity. They're suppressing the truth. I was listening to this advisor to Klaus Schwab, the Israeli historian, medieval historian, uh, Noah Yair, anyway, And he was speaking of atheism as if it was a fact. He said, scientifically, we know this isn't true. What? Well, he's not a scientist. The fact of the matter is, when Darwin was around, there was no such thing, of course, as information science. Now there is. You've heard me say this. Uh, A mainframe computer might have 100, maybe 200,000 lines of digital information. The human genome alone, just the human genome, has 13 billion of nucleotide sequences. Plus uracil with the RNA. Information cannot come from a vacuum. Information science says if you have a program, there had to be a pre-existing intelligence. Somebody had to write the master program. There might even be programs that can write other programs, but it had to begin with an existing intelligence. That's information science. The complexity of the biosphere? Even the complexity of the atom, to think it happened random by chance, and <laughs> ex nihilo, it's not rational. They suppress the truth. The most simple mind can know there's a creator. Now we saw at the Tower of Babel and so forth, how man made his own religions. And what man attempted to do at the Tower of Babel, of course, He's attempting to do again, man thinking he can control evolution by biogenetic engineering and by biometrics. But I don't want to go there now. I'm simply saying God's invisible attributes, according to scripture, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Anybody can understand it. They're without excuse. For well, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. When you look at the Psalms of Osiris in Egypt or the Epic of Gilgamesh, other people knew about the creation, Adam and Eve. Other people knew about the flood. The Torah of Moses, 
was a polemic against the pagan corruptions of it. Because the Torah of Moses was based on monotheism. They went into speculations, leading to polytheism. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but became futile in their speculations and foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. You see these people, academics, who, who are atheistic? They profess to be wise. The Dawkins and these guys, but they're fools. The fool says in his heart, there's no God. They're fools. They're absolute fools. God has given them over to believe nonsense in judgment. Now, understand the background Paul is writing to. Rome is the religious center of the world, as well as the economic and political center at this time. In Rome was the Pantheon, the gods of all the nations in the Roman Empire were represented in the Pantheon, except for the God of Israel. They had a separate covenant. I'll speak to that briefly, but only briefly. The Pantheon was there. The mystery religions of Babylon, as you've heard me say before, found their way through Asia Minor, the city of Pergamum. Literally, the 300 priests of Babylon moved from Babylon to Pergamum and set up shop. Jesus spoke of Pergamum where Satan's throne is. And from there, the paganism, the idolatry went in all directions. Mithrash worship to the south and Athena worship to the north, and so forth. But then it winds up via Athens, primarily in Rome. Peter, writing from Rome, says she was in Babylon, Greece. The Pantheon is there. As the Jews had Jerusalem and the temple still standing at this time, the pagans had the Pantheon the head of the pantheon being the emperor. As you heard me point out, he was the pontiff, the pontificus maximus, the title inherited, bequeathed by the emperor to the pope when Constantine relocated his capital to Constantinople. He bequeathed that headship to the Bishop of Rome. So this goes on. This is the religious center of the world. Paul saying no. Now, the Romans, of course, uh, and I know some of you know this, had religio licita. They'd give everybody a license to practice any religion they wanted as long as they sacrificed, prayed to the emperor as God made man, <laughs> as a divine being. You can have any religion you want as long as you accept the pontiff. The Jews made a deal where they would sacrifice for the pontiff instead of to him. <laughs> Initially, Jewish Christians were protected by this. But once they were expelled from the synagogues because of their faith in Jesus, they were no longer protected and they became religio illicita. They were persecuted by the Roman government. Again, I point you to the book, The Dilemma of Laodicea, or to some of our other teaching tapes that we did on the Isle of Patmos. Now, he's speaking in this kind of environment, and he is proclaiming what this is. He's saying, look at it. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. They deified all kinds of things. 
serpents, monsters. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their heart to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. Wherever you have idolatry, immorality follows. Wherever there is idolatry, there is gross immorality. You see this in Islam, you see this in Hinduism, you see this in Buddhism. Wherever there is idolatry, there is immorality. And you certainly see it in Roman Catholicism. And you see it in Mormonism. Wherever there is idolatry, immorality will come on the heels of it. An immorality of a kind that is often perverse and unnatural, as with the Romans, including pedophilia. It's no coincidence that the religion of the pontiff then saw widespread pedophilia and homosexuality, and the religion of the pontiff today is characterized by the same kind of immorality. There's a reason. It comes from the same place. And God gives them over to it, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchange the truth of God for a lie. You exchange the truth of God for a lie, immorality is going to follow. And they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. Oh boy. Fallen man will serve what's created instead of the creator. You see this with the New Agers. You see it with the whole Gaina stuff, the Mother Earth stuff that comes from Hinduism. The, the, you see it in Wicca, the, the form of witchcraft that's nature worship, the Wicca. You see it in the Druid religions with, with the sun worship. This has gone on for centuries. The, once you exchange the truth of God for a lie, and you can know there's a true God, and you worship and serve what's created instead of the one who created it, now we get to where we've come full circle. Verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. You just look at this today. Rachel Maddow and Ellen DeGeneres and it's seen as normal. Why is it seen as normal? What Hollywood doesn't get is the reason it seems normal is because God gave them over to it. How can somebody who's speaking here about those of us with double X chromosomes. They have mammary development. They have ovulation. They know naturally that they were anatomically and physiologically designed as women. And the reproduction, reproductive functions of the female anatomy and physiology cannot work in a same-sex relationship. But you have a Supreme Court justice testifying before the United States Congress that she doesn't know what a woman is. How can something get that far and be that stupid? 
a, a primitive tribe will know from Mensis that, that there's something is happening to a woman and that she's a woman. How can it be this before the U.S. Congress, Senate? Because God has given them over. MSNBC has no clue. CNN has no clue. Washington Compost has no clue. They have no clue. But we are supposed to know that what we are witnessing and seeing existed in pagan Rome in the first century, and it exists now, and it's going to exist and even exasperate to the time Jesus comes. And it's happening because God has given them over to degrading passions, for the women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. Now notice it puts lesbianism first. The Isle of Lesbos in Greece, or the Aegean, is a named colony of lesbians. The natural function for that which is unnatural. Remember, Eve sinned first, then Adam. So you see it here, it's the women, then the men. In the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the dual penalty of their error. Oh, boy. Carposi sarcoma. An HIV infection rate thousands of times higher than heterosexuals. Lower life expectancy, reduced longevity. Higher rates of substance abuse. The suicide rate among transsexual men is 50%. Half of these people are going to kill themselves. When Senator Rand Paul, U.S. Senator, who happens to be a physician, an eye surgeon, an ophthalmologist, he's an eye surgeon, was questioning another physician, the transgender <laughs> Under Secretary of Health, that Levine was a four star admiral or something. <laughs> and Levine is there pretending to be a woman, identifying herself as a woman. And this is one physician questioning another, coming from medical journals about the ramifications and clinical side effects and repercussions, medically, scientifically, clinically, of genital mutilation. And Senator Paul, a physician, is throwing the medical evidence at Levine, a physician. And Levine is saying, I will discuss that with you privately in, after I get the job. <laughs> that was the response. And he still gets approved by the Democrat Senate, not that I'm a Republican. Well, how can this be so sick? This is one physician talking to another physician. Both of them know the clinical and, and, and physiological realities. Because God's given him over. Doesn't matter how educated he is. Receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And suicide rate is 50% that those guys are going to kill themselves. Now, again, this advisor to Schwab, Hariri, it's his name, uh, Hariri, he knows that no matter what happens, he's a homosexual and he has a husband or whatever and that there's X and Y chromosomes. Somebody can have themselves surgically 
sculpture to resemble the opposite sex, but the DNA in every cell in their body determines that they are chromosomally male or female. He's saying that biogenetic engineering is going to become such that that definition won't apply anymore. You see, homosexuals know it's unnatural, so they're wanting it to somehow find a way to make it natural. And they're resorting to biometric means now. They're resorting to, obviously, cosmetic surgery. They're resorting to all kinds of psychotherapies. And they're demanding the right to teach it to children, ages four to seven. And if they can't teach it, they're saying it's homophobic hate speech, that you won't let us teach this as normal to your kids. Now, these people who do this, they don't have any idea that they have come under what the scripture calls a spirit of error. Now you can't believe the truth. Like Micaiah and Ahab's false prophets, God says, I will put a lying spirit in the mouth of your prophets. Or like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 with the Antichrist, the Lord will send a deluding influence to make them believe what is false. There's a spirit of error. Now they can't believe the truth. They've been given over to it in judgments. Verse 28. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Now notice, immorality is followed by depravity. Depravity. They're depraved. What is conventionally, not just right and wrong, what is conventionally natural is not natural to them. They're depraved. Talk about depravity. Okay. Do those things which are not proper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, filled with envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, Insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Well, turn with me, please, to First Timothy. The Spirit explicit in first chapter four, the Spirit explicitly says, in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Notice here it's warning Christians, warning Christians. They will fall away paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Saved Christians will believe doctrines of demons. Men who forbid marriage. Again, they go along with the whole Roman Catholic celibacy thing. And advocate abstaining from foods and all this kind of stuff. They push the whole... Hinduistic vegetarian agenda, 
wait a minute, Jesus was a Jew, celebrated Passover, and he ate lamb. He certainly ate fish. I mean, <laughs> you want to be a vegetarian, be a vegetarian, but don't make a religion out of it. Now, what are we told? We are told a danger in the last days will come to save Christians. We are also told by Paul in 2 Timothy the following. Chapter 3. Parallel this with what it says in Romans 1. In the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control. No ecrete. Brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And they'll be religious about it. They'll go to church holding to a form of godliness, though they have denied its power. Avoid men such as these. Whoa. This stuff that was prevalent, it was mainstay in pagan Roman society, would, at the close of the age, become mainstay again in its prevalence and a danger that Christians would be caught up in it, would backslide into it. A lot could be said about that. Verse 32, although they knew the ordinance of God in Romans 1, although they knew the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. Well, on an obvious level, those who approve of abortion, and this is the hypocrisy. I remember Ted Kennedy and I watched him on, what, what do you call that thing in the States? Uh, see the, the news thing. See, I forget what it's called. See something. It was, it's a news channel, but it was bef before Fox and all that stuff. <clears throat> and it was a C-SPAN or something. I don't know. But he was at the press club in Washington. And he was asked the question, how do you reconcile being pro-abortion with your Catholic faith? And he begins by saying, my faith is very important to me, <laughs> but I am pro-choice. He somehow saw the two as compatible. Either you believe that the fetus is a human life. Well, you don't. And the scientific and medical evidence says it is. Just a politician speaking out of both sides of his mouth. That was Ted Kennedy. Nancy Pelosi is another good Catholic girl. She says the same thing. Now, of course, this testifies to the moral bankruptcy of Roman Catholicism. They don't do anything or say anything about the politicians. What is Joe Biden, Irish Catholic? He was asked the same kind of question. He's pro-same-sex married. He's... Now the Pope, the present Pope, will not morally commit to upholding what is supposedly Roman Catholic dogma in the area of sexual morality. Well, if the Pope doesn't, why should I? <laughs> Who am I to judge? The Pope this week, this week, the present Pope Francis said, to Catholic parents who have homosexual children, you know. <laughs> Accept it, basically. 
It's all gone. Now notice, in God's economy, in his eternal jurisprudence, those who approve of these things are as guilty as the ones who do it. You approve of non-therapeutic abortion, you've had one. You approve of same-sex marriage, you, you did it. It's those who approve of it, God says, are co-equally culpable as the ones who do it. That's his standard. Oh, I was pro-choice, but I never had an abortion. <laughs> You're just as guilty as the one who did. That is the environment Paul was in. And that is the environment we are in. Lord willing, we will be continuing next Thursday the same way. If you can join us on RTN for Word for the Weekend on Saturday evening in the UK time, 11 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, we will be looking at the five satyrs, the five paschal satyrs in Scripture. That will be, uh, so obviously it's something we're doing for Passover, Easter, call it what you will. We'll be doing that this Saturday night, the five satyrs. Well, thank you so very much for listening. Sandy? Oh, please pray for Elizabeth. She's normally with us, and she has been hospitalized twice, and she's not doing very well at all. Um, Elizabeth Campbell, she's normally with us. Please keep Elizabeth's health in prayer. Yes, definitely. Uh, we pray for her and others who are uh, suffering with the different ailments and situations in our group. Uh, and uh, appreciate your prayers. Um, okay, I am going to make it so you can unmute yourself. Uh, please keep your questions to the subject of today's Bible study and also keep them short because others might want to speak. Recording stopped. Okay. Jacob, thank you for making mention of Elizabeth Campbell. I was going to ask you about her. She's been in my heart and mind for the last couple of weeks. I talked to her today. Uh, she's out of hospital, but she needs prayer. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Any questions? Uh, go ahead, Tracy. Um, I was just wondering, you know, how you say about Paul's day, our day, and very similar parallels. Is this also similar to Nineveh when they turned and how Nahum said, your your men are like women? Yes, absolutely. Your, the book of Nahum, absolutely, yes. We have a teacher. The borders are wide open, yes. which is we, pretty much yes. us. So it's, it's kind of pre-fall of the nation, correct? Yes, we have an old teaching from the book of Nahum, and it addresses that very issue. I think it's available on the website that I did some years, a long time ago, I mean 25 years ago or something, but it's still available on Nahum. And that was the truth. I mean, look at our army. I mean, it's more worried about being woke. Yeah, of course. And just, <laughs> of course. It's like the prophet Nahum is speaking to the United States. We talk Very about same. that on we talk about that on the recording about the conflict between Egypt and Assyria at the time between Nineveh and Thebes, and we applied it to the present political scenario in the world. That was the same kind of thing. Uh, so what you're saying, I agree with, but I would refer you to mm -hmm. the to the tape on that home. Okay, thank you. Mm. Wait, wait, wait. Jacob? All right, go ahead. Yes. Jeff. Yes. Um, a few years ago, my friend who's in the world invited myself and my daughter, who is here tonight, Simone, 
to her daughter's wedding to her partner, who was a girl. So it was Mrs. and Mrs., you know. And so I, I, didn't, I didn't even acknowledge that I'd received it. But a, a, a week or so after receiving it, we went to a funeral. My daughter was there. And the first thing she said, she was there. And the first thing she said to me was, oh, you didn't reply to Bianca's um, invite. And I just thought, you don't want to know why. It's best you just don't say anything. <laughs> and I just sort of moved yeah. on. But um, Mrs. and Mrs., two gorgeous girls, married. <laughs> and it seems to be the dumb thing. Yeah, I know. Um, well, do, first of all, do you have a question? Did, did you want to ask a question? No? Uh, Sandy, am I 